In the last video I created the level, so now let's create the player. I'll start off by making a new scene and create a new node inside of it. This is going to be a character body 2D. Then I can rename this character to my player. Now you'll notice that there's a little warning triangle over here. And that's because the character body 2D needs a couple of things. First of all, it will need an image. And secondly, it will need a collision shape. So to add an image, we add a child node. This isn't going to be a static image though. It's going to be animated. So we will add in an animated sprite 2D node. And we will also add a collision shape 2D node as well. Now make sure that when you add both of these, they are both children of the player class, not children of each other. For the player sprite, I'm going to use this sprite sheet and I'll put a link to this one in the video description. It's split into 24 different images. Vertically, we have the animation itself. So there are three frames to each of the different animation types. And then it's split into eight columns, one for each direction that the player is facing in. What I then did was split that up into individual images. So if I go into my assets folder and into the player, I've split them into compass headings. So if we take north, for example, then that's the images of the player heading in the vertical north direction. We will use all of these when we set up the player movement properly, but for now, I just want to be able to get an image up on the screen. We'll go into the animated sprite node, and on the right-hand side, I will create new sprite frames. And if I click on it again, it brings up this tab here. It gives me a default animation, which I will rename to walk zero. And for this, I will take my images from the east facing animation. So I will click all of these three and drag them over. We can actually see the image appear over here, but it's very small. So I want to scale this up. I go into transform and I'll change the scale from one to five. And that makes the image much bigger. But you'll notice it's a little bit blurry. I can go into my texture property here and change the filter from inherit to nearest. That sharpens up the image, but I'm going to have to do this for every animation that I have. So instead, I can change this globally on the entire project. If I go into the project settings and then scroll up a little bit, go into rendering, select textures, and for the default texture filter, I'll change it from linear to nearest. Now this will apply it to the whole project and all of my images will have this filter which just keeps the images sharp rather than blurry. If I click the play button down here, it's going to play the animation so we can see what it will look like. And you can see it actually looks kind of funny in between a couple of the frames. And that's because when it gets to the end here at frame two, it restarts back at frame zero. But between those frames, the player's legs should kind of be in this middle position. So it's kind of like it does a little flip between frames two and zero. What I want to do is duplicate this one. I'll select it, click on copy, and then click on paste, and it adds an extra frame right at the end. When I play it now, the animation is a bit more accurate. Now that we have an image, we can create a collision shape around it. We'll go over here and we'll select a new rectangle shape, click it again, and this rectangle shape appears here. I can just click and drag to extend it to the outside of my image. I'm not going to extend it fully because the player's body doesn't really go that far. It's just his head. So I will kind of just capture most of the image inside of it, but leave a little bit of space left and right. Now I can save my scene as a player inside of my scenes folder and go back into my main scene and instantiate it here. So we'll click that chain link again, click on the player and bring it through. And now you can see that we've got our world map from before, but we also have the player as a child node at the top. If I press F5, we can see the bottom right of the player coming up at the top here. Let's add some movement to the player. We go back into the player scene, select the player node and click this icon up here to add a new script. The script is empty. All it does is extend the character body 2D node, which is what this node originally was. So we extend this functionality, but we can add more to that. First, I'm going to define the physics process function. This is a built-in function inside of Godot, and it allows us to handle player movement and collisions inside of it. I'll add a comment to say player movement, and this will be broken up into two parts. The first part is that I need to get input from the player, first of all. So I need to get some keyboard input, which I will then convert into actual movement of our player node. 
To get this keyboard input, I will create another function above this one, and this will be called get input. I want the player to be able to move up, down, left, and right. So I need to actually map these keys into our game. We go into project, project settings, and then click on the input map tab up here. Here I can add additional actions. I'll create up, down, left, and right. And once I've done that, if I click on the little plus next to them, I can assign a key. I want W to go up, S to go down, A is going to go left, and D is going to go right. So it's just the classic WASD controls. Now I can take my keyboard input inside of this function and I will assign it to a new variable, which is my input direction. This variable is going to be equal to input, which is a built-in Godot function, dot get underscore vector. And this will map my four inputs into directions. So left, right, up, and down. And it has to be in that order. Well, I've already created those inputs in the input map just now. So I can just add them in here as strings. My left vector is going to be my input map for left. Then we have right, up, and then lastly we have down. Now whenever I press one of those keys, it will create a vector that is in that direction. Once I have that vector, I can update my velocity. I can say velocity is equal to input direction multiplied by my speed. But I haven't defined the speed for this player yet. I'll go right up to the top before I create any functions and I will define a new variable called speed and I assign a type to it of integer. I will then create another function called ready. This is another built-in function in Godot and this will fire as soon as this player node is loaded. And in here, I can assign an actual value to my speed variable, which I will set to 200. Next, we will call this get input function from our physics process function, and then we can take that velocity and then we need to apply it to the player. Well, this can be done with another Godot function, which is move and slide. What this will do is take that velocity, move the player, but it will also handle collision. And I can test this now. If I press F5, the player's disappeared, but if I move down, you can actually see him coming up on the screen. The player will move and slide along this, but you can see that it doesn't go through the bushes because we previously set up collision shapes for them as well. So it didn't actually take a lot to be able to create the player and add in movement. You notice the player was quite big though. I think I scaled it far too high. So let's change this from five to 3.75 and try that again. And that should give us a smaller player image. That's a bit more reasonable. There we go. So that does look better. However, I think the collision shape will probably still be the wrong size. Yeah. So we'll just bring that down accordingly and just match it up with our new player image size. Okay, so that is looking better, but the player is still starting in a top left corner. We could manually just move the player on our main scene. So we could just grab him from there and shift him over here. But I don't really want to do that. I want to position him using the code. So we'll go back into our script and we will expand our ready function. What we need to know, first of all, is where the middle of our game window is. And to know that, we need to know how big the game window is. We'll create a new variable at the top, which is going to be our screen size and assign it to a vector two type. Then inside the ready function, as soon as this player enters the scene, we take the screen size by looking at our viewport, getting its rectangle and then getting the size property of that. That will give us a vector two with an X and a Y size. So a width and a height. I can now use that to set the player's position. I'll say that position is equal to screen size divided by two. If I run this again, the player is now starting in the middle of the screen. Another thing we want to be able to do is restrict the player movement because we don't want him going off the end of the screen. We want to limit it to just our game window. So after we handle the movement down here, I'll add a comment to say movement movement to the window size. To do that, we reassign our position variable and then we use our existing position, but we run the clamp function on it. Clamp just limits it between two variables, a minimum and a maximum. For the minimum, we want to use vector two with zero values inside it. And for the maximum, we will use our screen size. That essentially just draws a big box from the coordinate zero, zero 
to the width and height of our game window. And that will restrict the movement so that when I get to the edge, I can't actually get past it anymore. Now let's add in some player animation. The player is only really going to be in two states. He's either going to be walking or not walking. And if the player is walking, well, that means that he has a velocity. We can look at our velocity variable and take its length. Anything greater than zero means that the player is moving in any given direction. So I can just compare it. If it's not equal to zero, then we want to play the animation. To do that, we need to access this animated sprite 2D node. We just click and drag it down here. And then at the end, just add dot play. Otherwise, if the player is not moving right now, well, we want to do the same thing, but now we want to stop the animation. So we replace the play with a stop. This could end up with the animation stopping halfway through though. So we want to make sure that after we've stopped it, we reset the frame back to the very first one. So we'll set the frame to one. Well, I guess in reality, that isn't the first one. If I go back into my animated Sprite 2D, the frame that I actually want to use is this one, which is the first one where he is standing fully still and isn't in the middle of a step. So that's why I used frame one and not frame zero. Let's try this out. We'll press F5. And now as I walk, we can see the animation is playing. Now we want to add in player rotation because at the moment he's only facing to the right. I want the player to always look at the mouse. This way I can aim with the mouse and move with the keyboard. For that, I need to know where the mouse is. I'll say that mouse is equal to get local mouse position. This will give me the X and Y coordinates of the mouse. Next, I can work out the angle that I need to rotate by. It took me a little while to try and figure out how to do this. And I actually found a really good tutorial on it by Kids Can Code. So rather than just repeating all of that information here, I will leave a link to it so you can go into the detail of how it works and I would just paste in the code that is used in that video that I then used in this game. But essentially we look at the angle between the mouse and the player, and then we place that into one of eight quadrants. We can then wrap those quadrants from zero to eight, which is the same as the number of directions that my player sprite sheet has. And now this variable here, angle, is going to go from zero to eight. If we go back into my animated sprite and into my sprite frames, I have my first animation, which is facing to the right as walk zero. So what I will do is create the other seven and name them walk one, walk two, walk three, and so on, starting with the one that faces east and then just rotating clockwise. I will set up the first one here. So I'll name this to walk one. And if we continue going clockwise from east, the next one is going to be southeast, which is down in this SE folder. So I click and drag these images over just the same way as I did before. Then I take the still one in the middle where he's just standing upright and not halfway through a step, copy and then paste it at the end as well. And now just repeat the same process until you have eight walk animations with all of these images inside of them. And when you've finished, this is what you should have. Eight different animations with the player looking in each of the eight different directions. With that done, what I can now do is use this angle variable to assign the specific animation direction. So just underneath here, I will drag over the animated sprite node again, and I will set the animation to be equal to walk, which is just the start name of all of them. But then we have a number, and that number is going to be the string of the angle variable. If we run this now, Every time I move the mouse, you can see that the player is now looking towards it. And the animation is controlled by the player movement. So I can move the player around with the keyboard while also changing his direction with the mouse. There's one thing in the movement that might not be immediately obvious. When I move left and right and up and down, I move at the same speed. But if I move diagonally, I actually move a little bit faster. And that's because it's two vectors being added up together. What I need to do is make sure that that speed is the same no matter which direction I face in. So up here, where I assign my velocity, I just need to add dot normalized. Doing this will make sure that no matter which direction I'm moving in, it's always happening at the same speed. I'm sure there's different ways of getting this eight directional movement working. I thought that this one was quite good, but if you guys know of a different way of doing it, then please let me know in the comments.
And that will do for this video. If you found it useful, then please leave a like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one.